lovelies and welcome back to the Bandit channel. I am Hazel and I am here today to bring you another fabulous book review. Today I'm going to be starting a new series of reviews on Ben Aronovich's wonderful Peter Grant series. Now if you're a fan of urban fantasy these are definitely books for you. I love them. I am going to be doing something a little bit different with these because they're mainstream books. I decided that um, I would do a kind of a, a fuller sort of analysis and include a synopsis as well. So there are going to be two videos for each of these books. One is going to have a full synopsis including my analysis of the whole plot and all the characters and everything in it. That will be quite long. The other one is just going to be a shorter one which is just going to give you a bit of an overview like I would do with any other book. So this is the long one. If you're not up for a bit of a marathon you know you might want to hit pause and Rivers of London is um, really quite different as far as urban fantasy goes. It's um, very British. Very, very British. I love this. So obviously I'm English. I would love it. Um, but that is the first thing to note. So if you are not British and watching this, there are some things that may not quite make so much sense to you. Now I really like the opening to this book, it doesn't fluff about giving you a load of stuff that you don't need to know, it plunges you straight into the heart of the action and also straight into the core relationship of not only this book but of the whole series so far and that's between Peter, the central character who narrates it, and uh, his partner, I say partner, he's a police officer, I should have mentioned that first, uh, his partner Leslie. So um, it's very witty, it's very fast paced and the opening sequence immediately gets across an awful lot of information, far more information than you might at first think. Um, Aronovich has this fabulous, fabulous way with his prose of getting loads of, of details and facts in there that a lot of authors would just kind of dump on you in a rather, you know, unpleasant way. You know when you get those info dumps and you just say like, ugh. I know I needed to know that, but did you really have to say it like that? It's not like that here. I don't know how he does it, but he just kind of weaves it in amongst everything. So you get loads of information about London, which is where it's set. Again, should have mentioned that. Um, and also loads and loads of information about the Metropolitan Police Department and how it works, which is actually really interesting. But if you were told it all at one go and, and you know in a very dry and dull way it will be really really boring <laughs> but because it's it's kind of given to you in little tidbits here and there and through how Peter does things and how he thinks and how he's you know talking to people and everything it's really really interesting so I really love that about it. So here we find Peter Grant a young London police officer who has been assigned along with his partner Leslie May to guard the scene of a particularly bizarre and rather brutal murder. The huddled in the cold and the dark, it's night, they're on opposite sides of St Paul's Cathedral and Leslie takes it upon herself to go for coffee, as you can imagine you would in that situation. Um, it's really immediately obvious that Peter's got a serious crush on this girl. He really, really likes Leslie. That's um, very clear right from the beginning. But what's also clear is that it is entirely based on her looks. You know, he doesn't wax lyrical on how intelligent she is and what a good police officer she is, which we later find out is actually the case. No, he talks about her face. He talks about her boobs. He later talks about her ass at length. It it's you know purely physical in that sense i'll come back to that point later i just wanted to mention it now so leslie heads off for coffee and almost immediately afterwards a, a man appears on the opposite side of the square and beckons peter over he goes over and the man introduces himself as nicholas Woolpenny. And this man says that he witnessed the murder and proceeds to describe it in detail. A brutal attack on a man, you know, the beheading of the murder victim by a man who strangely appeared to have the ability to change his face. And um, if Peter didn't think that was odd enough, this man 
then tells him that he is in fact a ghost. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you meant to do with that. So he stood there in the square with this supposed witness telling him that not only was the murder committed by a man who could change his face, but also, also that, oh by the way, I also happen to be dead. Um, I really quite like the way this is kind of handled. Um, refreshingly little time is wasted on Peter wondering whether or not he's gone mad and, and you know questioning whether he really saw what he thinks he saw. He briefly laments the fact that he wakes up the next morning and it transpires it, it, it wasn't a dream and he does still remember it clearly. Um, but then he promptly goes and tells Leslie what he saw without any kind of worry that she's going to think he's nuts. <coughs> he just tells her. So she obviously thinks he's nuts but apparently it's fairly normal for Peter to come out with random things like this so she just kind of goes with it. <laughs> um, and they go off continue their investigation as they would normally. The strange thing is when they when they find some CCTV footage they discover that the description given by Peter's ghost is actually fairly accurate which is weird because you know face changing guy and all um, and also the way he actually commits the murder is is it sh defies physics basically so it shouldn't really have been able to happen and yet there it is so that night Peter decides to kind of go back to the crime scene in search of his ghost but instead he finds this rather peculiar detective named Nightingale who walks with a fancy stick and appears to be quite impressed when Peter introduces himself and tells him that he's there hunting ghosts. Now you would expect from a senior detective meeting a young police officer and asking what he's doing there that when he told them he was out hunting ghosts he'd find it odd. Not Nightingale. No, he's impressed. That should have been the first warning, really. Anyway, the following day, Peter has his uh, placement interview. He's come to the end of his training and it's time for him to be put into a role. Um, it's something, you know, it's just standard. Nothing particularly different, but it's quite important because he has a particular role in mind. He wants to be a detective. And um, he gets into the interview and it very quickly becomes clear that his ideas for what he wants to do with his life and the ideas of the, the rest of the kind of department differ quite vastly. Yeah, the interviewer makes it very clear that Peter is um, maybe not the sharpest tool in the box. He's, he's quite easily distracted and in fact we see this ourselves because he seems to spend most of his time when he's supposed to be watching crime scenes and investigating things reading the various historical plaques around London to find out about buildings and monuments. Now in fairness I think this is a contrivance of the author to explain away how Peter knows so much about London. Um, so you can kind of forgive it for that but it does get really annoying it's the I, I passed this building and it was a 17th century brick stone something or other made of this that and the other and I know all of this because there was this one time when I was standing in such a park and I happened to be passing a square and I saw this plaque and I read it and it's like the first couple of times he mentions that he read something on a plaque you're like oh yeah you know he's interested in history and then like the 50th time you're there like for the love of god I get it he likes to read plaques you don't have to keep telling me and it also I think it detracts from the personality of London which is I'll get to this later but it's one of the really good things about this book London is a personality in these books it's like a character all of its own right and that really comes through in the descriptions of it and, and how much the characters in the novel really love London. But the fact that Peter constantly feels the need to explain how he knows so much about the city that he loves is it's a bit like, well, I, d I don't really think you need it because if you live in a city long enough, you come to know it really well. I mean, I only lived in Manchester for three years <laughs> and I know it ridiculously well. And I know a lot of its history because I lived there and I loved it and it was interesting. You just don't need it. Leslie, on the other hand, knows exactly what she's about. She's clearly a very, very good copper. 
Despite this, Peter is very surprised to discover that he's been assigned to a special division that he's never even heard of, led by Detective Nightingale. He's promptly moved into the Folly, which is a huge and impressive mansion where Nightingale lives and works alone, apart from um, Molly, who is his very peculiar housekeeper. Throughout the series we learn that many people in the police department are actually aware of Nightingale's department and they're aware of the folly. Um, there are some civilians as well who know about it, but it's supposedly a secret sort of clandestine department that deals with magic, but everybody knows about it. I actually find it really refreshing that everybody knows about it and most of them have a really, really kind of blasé attitude towards it and, um, you know, it, they, they don't particularly like the fact that magic exists and that it interferes with their cases and that they have to deal with it, but they do accept the fact that it exists. There's no freaking out, there's no, you know, like running around and getting annoyed with people when they're... Um, coming in and saying that it's magical, you know, interference or whatever, you know, Nightingale turns up and they all know what that means and they just get on with it. That's the end of it and that is really, you know, it's a really kind of um, new way of doing things. It's, it's a similar sort of reaction that Peter had when he met the ghost. It's kind of, you take a second to sort of think, huh, and that's it, you move on. Um, most of them are just aware of it sort of peripherally they've heard of it vaguely um, and if they haven't heard of it at all once they're told about it there's no kind of freaking out and the oh my god magic's real it's just like ha huh, magic's real that's cool move on I love it it's great so the murder investigation continues and Peter and Leslie discover that the perpetrator was a man called Coopertown and that he was bitten by the victim's dog a couple of days before. They head over to his house um, but find he's out of the country on business and uh, his wife tells them that the, the thing with the dog biting him it, it wasn't a big deal or anything he actually found it funny so it's not like it's a motive for murder so they leave without any clue of you know why he might have killed the guy and go back to see him when he returns a few days later. Um, this is probably, well no not probably, this is the most disturbing part of the book, this bit. They return to Cooperstown's house to see him and arrive just in time to witness him throwing his infant, his baby out of the window, top story window, and then murdering his wife. So in the space of a literally a couple of pages you, you get him killing a baby and then killing his wife it's really really quite brutal it's you know it's a comedy book but there's just no way to get around this fact that that this is really is it's a nasty scene it's um it's a horrible thing that happens and uh, it, you know he doesn't even try and play it for comedy or anything it's played as a a straight kind of scene that you would expect from any serious book so i i actually i appreciate the fact that he let it be what it was. He didn't try and take the horror out of it in any way by putting anything funny in there. He just made it real. So in London, the main river is obviously the Thames. And this is ruled by not one but two river spirits. That's Father Thames and Mama Thames. It's actually a lot more complicated than this though, as Peter discovers when he goes to speak to Mama Thames, who is a woman from Nigeria who um, has been in the position since um, the 1950s when Father Thames decided he no longer wanted anything to do with the river running through the actual city itself because it was it was vile and disgusting so he kind of left it and went up north a little bit to to the countryside where the river was nicer and cleaner and um, left the river to its own devices and um, Mama Thames a woman at the time tried to kill herself by throwing herself into the river and the river took her and claimed her and uh, since then she's been the river spirit of that area. She also has several daughters um, who are the river spirits of various tributaries and, and other rivers and Father Thames has sons, you get it. 
So it's quite complicated and there are quite a lot of these flipping river spirits that babble around everywhere. One of whom is Beverly Brook. Yes, really. And um, Peter, being Peter, develops a, a, an immediate and quite obvious attraction towards her. Um, and she appears to kind of like him a bit too uh, and later comes to tell him that there's been a weird attack at the hospital that's similar to the murder she knows Peter is investigating so she's trying to help basically. In the new case there's a bike courier who has randomly and really viciously attacked a doctor for no apparent reason before disappearing from the hospital without getting any treatment for the injuries he came in for. So while Peter is investigating the messenger, uh, another similar incident occurs where two people attack each other for no apparent reason, a fight with no cause, and um, this sort of thing keeps happening until uh, they finally catch up with the courier only to, to find he uh, attacks the doctor again um, before suffering the same kind of facial collapse that Cooperdown had. So um, they've kind of been running around in circles and not really getting to anybody in time. So Peter ends up speaking with Oxley and his wife Isis and they're very lovely and tell him all about everything and um, lament the fact that they're no longer able to go to the city because of this feud and it turns, it turns out that, that really they love the city, they just, they're not allowed to go because daddy says no. So this gives Peter an idea and he later takes Beverly to visit Oxley. Now he's working on the assumption that all the rivers are connected, which means they're all part of the same family. And they should therefore, in theory, be able to reach a peaceful agreement. Um, this kind of puts him at odds with one of Mama Thames's worst daughters, Tyburn. Um, she's Lady Ty. And, and she gets really quite pissed off that Peter's kind of been audacious enough to take her sister up river and suggest all of this without checking with anybody or doing anything and she generally just really doesn't like him. So she kind of attempts to put magical whammy on him and, and kind of influence him and, and get him under her control but he is actually able to break away. Now I found that quite impressive bearing in mind he doesn't really know much about magic yet He's only just started his training and um, and she is one of the river gods. Quite impressive. So while all of this has been going on, Peter has been experimenting with magic, which he has found has this alarming tendency to destroy certain mechanical elements and things, such as the inner workings of phones and computers, um, if they're connected to a power source at the time that the, the magic happens. Now, Peter has a, a very scientific approach to magic, which far exceeds the much-milked scientific education he has. Now, I'm not insulting anybody that didn't go to university. I'm just stating this as fact. He hasn't been to university and studied science. He has very um, basic qualifications in science, and he didn't get very good grades in those. So the assertion that he's got this scientific background. Um, it doesn't really explain the level of knowledge that he then goes on to have. Uh, I think it was kind of put in there to, to sort of explain how he knew all of this sciencey stuff so that he could do all of the sciencey stuff but it doesn't quite work because they don't quite match. You know, he's um, he's not the sort of person that sits around studying all the time and, and learning things on his own. You know, you can't explain it away by saying, oh, well, he's interested in science, so he must have just learnt it. He, he spends his time drinking beer and watching football. He's, you know, he's a typical bloke in that regard. So it's at this point that Peter decides that he really needs more information. He goes back to St Paul's and he tries to track down the ghost. Warpenny is actually there and tells him about an 18th century actor named Henry Pike who was murdered by another actor called Charles Macklin 
Now, according to Allpenny, the ghost of Pike is said to haunt the Opera House. Um, how this kind of relates to what's going on, it, it's a little too convenient that, that this information is just kind of given to him, and it's not entirely clear how this is relevant to the case at all. It just sort of seems like a so do you know anything else about this case well yes actually i do there's an opera house down the way and it's haunted by a ghost the two things don't quite connect you know the, the fact that there was a murder there and the fact that there is a ghost here there's nothing really to relate them but peter seems to have just kind of take it as read that they're related so off here leslie go to check out the Opera House where they see a Punch and Judy show and it's while they're watching this that they realise that the series of events in the Punch and Judy show are exactly the same as the series of events that have taken place so far in terms of the murders and these weird kind of attacks. So that's clearly not a coincidence and Peter comes to the conclusion that the murderer is playing the role of Punch. So he goes to Nightingale with this information and the two of them check out what happens next in the play and as it turns out the next thing that's supposed to happen is Punch gets arrested! Huzzah! So they come up with the cunning plan of inserting Peter into the narrative by making him play the role of the arresting constable which would work brilliantly because they'd end up with Punch arrested and obviously they want that anyway. They decide to arrest him for which they need a warrant and because he's a ghost they need a ghost warrant yes really so they go to a judge who is a ghost and um, Nightingale trades some magical energy with him for the warrant so you see ghosts kind of run or subsist I suppose on magical energy so in order to kind of stick around and stay ghosting they, they need magic basically um, and th this isn't really explained in any detail but um, it's actually quite important it's, it's also quite interesting I quite like it so ghosts don't just get to kind of be ghosts indefinitely and do whatever they want they actually need um, a power source or some, some, some sort of energy to renew them and replenish them otherwise they I guess they just disappear, I don't know. So, um, off they head to the Opera House to arrest Pike, armed with their warrant, but instead of doing this, Nightingale actually gets shot in the back, which was quite a, a unexpected turn of events, I have to say. And um, his injuries are, are really quite severe, and he gets taken to hospital, and he's put in a coma. So, Peter's placed on suspension, pending an investigation. The family's put under armed guard and Peter can't even get back in. And there's kind of varying degrees of mistrust and dislike on the part of other members of the police force concerning magical elements in these investigations. And now that Nightingale's out of commission, this distrust kind of becomes even more prominent. It's like everything's fallen on Peter. And um, everybody knows he's not really up to it you know he's he's only just found out about all of this stuff he was never seen as being a particularly good police officer in the first place so the fact that he's ended up in this position sort of rubs a few people up the wrong way and peter himself is you know he's alone and he's really confused um he's only got leslie and dr wallard to talk to and um, they believe in him and they offer help despite this he continues to investigate, working under the assumption that while the police may not like to acknowledge Nightingale and the Forry, <sighs> despite this, he continues to investigate, working under the assumption that while the police might not like to acknowledge Nightingale and the Forry, they are aware of the fact that that they are there are some things that only Nightingale can really sort out and they've come to rely on him for, for such matters and in his absence it falls on Peter. Um, now Nightingale is actually the only officially recognised English wizard remaining 
and he's not taken on an apprentice in 50 years um, he's got his reasons for this which we find out in later books but it really should be noted here that one of Nightingale's most interesting quirks I think is the fact that he is currently aging backwards um, he was born he lived to a ripe old age, he lived through both world wars, fighting definitely in World War Two. We're unsure whether he was fighting in World War One. And at some point, um he he just stopped growing older. So despite the mistrust of the department, um there is quite a lot of sort of turmoil among those who know about Nightingale when he's shot, and um not because he's injured, but because they don't think Peter's up to the job alone they they just don't really have much faith in him and they're afraid of what will happen their response is understandable if somewhat unhelpful and they essentially turn a blind eye to what peter does from that point onwards in the hope that he will somehow sort it all out for them the truth is that they don't actually have any other option if peter can't sort it out they don't have anyone else to turn to so Peter retraces his steps and the steps of everybody else involved in the investigation and realises that Leslie is the only one who has been present at every single crime scene. And this leads him to the conclusion that she must have been magically possessed way back on that first night when he, le he, he met the ghost three months previously. So with no magical backup and his partner willingly or not working for the wrong side Peter calls on Beverly Brooke for help and together they go to find Leslie who's at the opera house unfortunately she sees him as he's approaching the stage and he realizes way too late that the orchestra the cast everybody there have been put under some kind of spell and Leslie has been possessed by the spirits of Pike who is seriously irate at having been murdered and he's like crazed and out for revenge so Peter um, masquerades as Punch's executioner in an effort to get close enough to Leslie to drug her so Pike is essentially playing the role of Punch and Peter's working under the logic that if he is an actor in a role he will play his role and therefore if Peter plays the role of Punch's executioner he can get close enough to kill him. It's all a bit... Uh, but it does make sense. But Pike kind of twigs onto what he's trying to do and ends up stirring up the crowd until they create this mob that kind of spills out onto the street and sort of runs riot causing fires and general mayhem so Peter asks Beverly to call on her own powers in order to put out all the fires and she reluctantly does so sort of flooding the streets she does know at the time that she's going to get in terrible trouble for this but we're not actually told whether she does or whether there are any repercussions for her for it um, afterwards Peter returns home to his parents house wondering how a ghost could possibly have caused so much trouble and why what should have been a fairly clear case of, of one guy out for revenge would take such a peculiar twist and it's when he's on the tube home that he comes across a man who is possessed presumably a man who's come from the same riot that Peter's just been at and this guy is declaring that he's Mr. Punch, the spirit of riot and rebellion. And it's then that Peter realises that it's not actually Pike that's the problem. Pike was just like a conduit for this spirit of Mr. Punch to work through. The following day, Nightingale's awake and calling for Peter, who goes to see him and tells him everything that's happened, as well as his theories about Punch. Now Nightingale tells Peter that there is only one way he can think of to stop Punch and he's going to need Molly's help for this. Now Molly remember is the housekeeper, briefly mentioned her earlier, she's a wonderful character, I absolutely love her. She's, um, I always think of um, the girl from The Ring, you know the film, whenever I read anything that's got Molly in it, it's um, 
yeah she's really creepy but very cool so he's uh, he's got a plan but it means gaining access to the folly because he needs to get in to see molly so that means unfortunately <laughs> He's got to somehow convince Tyburn, that's Lady Ty, to um, give him access. Now she's got some influence with the police department. She's the only way that they can think of to actually get around this armed blockade that's keeping him out. So Peter spends a good chunk of his savings filling up a truck with alcohol, drives over to Mama Thames's house and gives it to her as an offering and convinces her to get Tyburn to let him back into the folly. So Tyburn doesn't actually agree to this, she's kind of forced to do it and this just gives her one more reason to just really hate his guts. Um, so he goes home to find Molly utterly morose at the loss of Nightingale, you know, she's just completely at a loss without him. But she cheers up when she finds out that he's awake and um, she listens to the plan and agrees to it before promptly sinking her teeth into him. So it's a little kind of, I don't know, vampire-y I suppose. But the act of biting him somehow connects them and she's able to magically guide him back in time. So they end up at the period when Pike was murdered and Peter is walking then through the streets of London that was trying to find where Pike was buried in the hopes that by exorcising the ghost of Pike he can get rid of Punch because Punch is using Pike as like a conduit. So he's going along trying to find out where he was buried and is absolutely shocked to find that Pike is actually Wallpenny, that's the ghost that he met at the beginning of the book. So not only has Leslie been possessed since that very first meeting at the beginning, but this guy has been playing Peter right from the start as well. And he's none too happy about that. So Peter um, chases him through the streets of London and as they're running around, they're going further and further and further back in time until they end up at a point when London was only just beginning as a city and Peter sees this ceremony taking place on the river and is slightly surprised to notice that the, uh, the, the priest, for want of a better word, who is presiding over this ceremony is actually Father Thames. But Father Thames doesn't seem even remotely surprised to see Peter, in fact he seems to have been expecting him all along and hands him a spear which Peter promptly uses to kill Punch. By doing so, he has essentially sacrificed Punch to the spirit of the river and in so doing strengthened his own position in terms of the negotiations between Mama and Father Thames. So um, not only was it helpful to Peter in the sense that it, it gave him a way to stop Punch, but it really sort of solidified his position among the rivers as, as an actual kind of a player rather than just some silly little policeman that they could ignore which is important for, for all the later books so when Peter wakes up he's still in the folly despite everything and very weak and after a bit of a dicey moment when Molly tries to eat him um, he manages to kind of calm her down and remind her that you know she doesn't really want to kill him um, and he goes upstairs to, to kind of rest in his room only to find Leslie still possessed by the ghost of Pike. Um, now obviously his first thought is that she is going to suffer the same fate that, that the others have and that she's going to die and that obviously she's going to suffer the horrible facial collapse and he um, calls Dr Wallet, who tells him you know best thing he can do to sort of help her but he actually isn't able to he's able to save her life but he's not able to save her face so Leslie's face is ruined just completely ruined she's alive but her face is just gone so the final note of the book sees Peter successfully negotiating a truce between father and mama Thames this all hinges on a hostage exchange 
which will see Beverly go and stay with Father Thames and one of Father Thames' sons come and stay with Mama Thames in the city. And both of them will be protected by the local deities, but similarly will be held accountable should anything happen to the other. So that sorts all of that out. Now, overall, this is really a very strong book and it's an excellent piece of urban fantasy. I am a huge, huge fan of urban fantasy and have read widely in the genre. To date, this series, with the exception of Kelly Armstrong's wonderful Women of the Other World series, is probably my favourite urban fantasy series. It has some very very strong characters in it. Granted some of the supporting characters are a little bit two-dimensional but the main characters are excellent. Peter is actually just a breath of fresh air as the main character because he's really not that good at his job. Um, Leslie is the one who's really really good at being a copper and she suffers for it, she really does. Peter on the other hand stumbles upon the supernatural and is rewarded really simply for being open to it. Peter is kind of plucked from what would otherwise have been a fairly mediocre existence. We are given a little sort of insight at the beginning of the book into what life would have been like for him, where his career was going before he runs into Nightingale and it's not what he wanted um, and he you know, doubtless would have found it very boring. So he's kind of taken off that path and thrust into this world where he is immediately not only at the heart of investigating murders which is what he wanted to do he always wanted to be a murder detective but he's also gifted with the world of magic and everything that goes with it beyond this characters are unusual because they take the supernatural in stride there's no freaking out when they see a ghost there's no refusal to admit that magic exists there's no kind of need to try and pretend that cases don't have magical elements to them. As soon as they realise there's anything going on that's even remotely magical, in comes the folly and that's it, Nightingale deals with it. While the majority of people outside the folly are reluctant to have anything to do with magic, they do acknowledge its existence and the need for someone who does deal with it. They don't like it, but they're fine having somebody around that will do it. So that's really quite unusual and something that I really appreciate. On the whole, the novel breaks a lot of cliches and conventions of this genre. In particular, magic has consequences and magic has limits. These are two things that are very often absent in fantasy, urban fantasy or otherwise, and it's nice to see it worked in from the very start. The consequences of using magic in this series are devastating both to humans and to the environment that they're in. Um, this gives a really plausible explanation for why people don't just use magic for everything. And that, again, is something that's often lacking in some stories. And despite my reticence concerning the validity of Peter's scientific knowledge, it's also nice to have the mix of the purely magical approach from Nightingale and the much more modern scientific approach from Peter. The fact that Peter isn't immediately a pro at magic is also a welcome change. He has to work really hard to learn and he's often lax in this area. In some ways that can be irritating. The reader is left feeling that given the circumstances he really should be more focused but I actually think it fits more with the character. Peter is not portrayed in any way at all um, as the kind of highly motivated, highly intelligent person who we often see in the main character of um, in the main character role in fantasy fiction. Um, Harry Potter is another example of this that's well done. Harry himself is not exceptionally bright or gifted, although he fares better than Ron. Everybody does. He has to work hard to learn. Um, he doesn't always do things well and the only thing he's really naturally good at is Quidditch. Um, it's Hermione in, in the Potterverse who's the, um, the highly motivated, highly intelligent person and she's the one who provides the answers when the protagonist needs them. 
and this role is filled by Leslie in Rivers of London and it works very well for the same reason that Hermione works well in Harry Potter. One person is very rarely all things so Harry may get up to a lot of heroics but if you actually analyse the books you quickly see he would never have succeeded without the aid of his friends and you can also see that it's often happenstance that places him in the positions that meant he had to take action in the first place. He performs admirably for the most part but he's not a natural hero in the traditional sense and neither is Peter who would not get very far at all without the input of others whether it's Leslie or Nightingale, Beverly or Mama or Father Thames, Dr. Wallet, even Tyrone on occasion, he needs input from others to understand what's going on around him. When he's left to his own devices, he tends to cause mayhem. Um, the American title for this novel is Midnight Riot, despite the fact the riot itself um, is a very small element of a much larger plot and doesn't go on for very long. Peter sets a precedent in this book for future books. Um, the situation leading to the riot escalates when he is robbed of those who can help him. He's cut off from the folly. He can't contact Molly. Nightingale is out of commission. Leslie is caught up in the action itself and can't help him. He's completely on his own. The result is a riot and the streets of London burning. <laughs> Literally this is what happens when he tries to deal with things alone and this in an odd way is why he's so lovable we can forgive him his flaws and we can forgive him his inexplicable knowledge and we can forgive him his laziness and his penchant for reading historical plaques because when it do when it comes down to it he gets the job done and he does it in a really entertaining way that is what peter grant is he's just entertainment he's funny throughout the whole novel with a level of dry British humour and wit that is really a joy to read and very refreshing considering how many books in this genre are American. Um, I really do appreciate the fact that this one is British. There are some horrific events in this book and the, the book itself is hilariously funny to read. At the same time the humour doesn't take over the whole book. This is a piece of urban fantasy, it's not comic fantasy, it just so happens to be bloody funny. <laughs> It's also detailed, it's imaginative and includes some really unique mythology that is a nice change of pace. But please don't think I'm going to do nothing but gush over this. While the book is very entertaining and extremely well written, it's not without its flaws. Although the setting and the transformation of London into a character in its own right is really nicely done, there are numerous instances throughout the book where I felt it was just overdone. Now, I'm a northern lass, you can probably tell from my voice, I have no truck with London. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you're a Londoner, but it's just not a place for me. In the six years since I have returned from down south where I was living for work for a short period, I have been back to London three times, once to go to the Globe Theatre wants to be a literary agent and wants to go and see Robin Hobb and George R. R. Martin. They were the only things that could compel me to return to London. And um, that's just, you know, that's not because I don't like cities. I love Manchester. I'm just, I'm just not a Londoner. And I think if you're not a Londoner, having the overwhelm of London is a bit like, oh, enough already. Um, a lot of it was interesting, you know, the history was interesting, um, a lot of it was stuff that I didn't know and um, that was good but you don't really need to know which street he's walking down and which street he's crossing over onto and which road he's going down and it, it's just like, it's just an overload, it was just excessive. Also if you're not actually from London and you've never been there it can get quite confusing. I have been to London on quite a few occasions and even I found it confusing. So it's just a surplus of information that isn't needed and it negates all that wonderful work Aronovich has done in weaving the really large quantities of information about the Metropolitan Police Department into the narrative. And I just, 
I find that odd that he can get so much info dump into the narrative in such a beautiful way and yet then kind of ruin it slightly with all of this extra London description. Well, it's an entertaining read, it's not life altering. There was no deeper meaning to the book, it's just entertainment. And while there's nothing wrong with this, a lot of people just read for entertainment, they want to escape, it left me wanting just a little bit more. Another issue is the use of two plots. There's the murder investigation going on and there's the situation with the rivers and these are happening in tandem and it's not until the very, very end that they interact and they only interact in a very brief manner. This leaves the reader kind of bouncing back and forth between the two with no real focus. I added to this with some additional red herrings such as the investigation of the vampires which added absolutely nothing to anything and just slowed everything down. And there was a general lag in the middle of the book where there wasn't really anything going on and it was all moving very slowly. What kept you reading at that point was the quality of the writing and the wit, not the plot. I've mentioned Peter's flaws as a good thing, but they can also get quite annoying. He forgets things very quickly, which means the reader is told the same thing over and over again sometimes. While his forgetfulness is quite an endearing personality trait, the repetitiveness is not welcome. Likewise, Peter is capable of making huge leaps in logic without any real evidence to speak of and in particular the crucial points in the plot where Peter realises first who the villain really is and shortly afterwards how they found out about a particularly important piece of information. These two revelations really do come out of thin air, there's just nothing there that would give him that, that kind of conclusion. I mean he's demonstrated repeatedly that he doesn't have Leslie's level of analytical thinking and uh, the kind of keen poli police mind, shall we say, um, that she has. So for him to kind of come to these conclusions without anything to base them on, it just doesn't quite work. We've seen he just doesn't do well on his own. He relies on other people for information. So having him come to these conclusions on his own is it's a real stretch, especially as we've seen. He relies on other people informing his thoughts. So um, it's not only a big leap in logic for him, it's a big leap in logic that he made completely alone and that just doesn't fit with the rest of his character. So there you have it darlings, that is my wonderful review of the wonderful Roses of London. I shall be back next week to do another review on book two, which is Moon Over Soho. Um, if you like the video, do please share it on Facebook or wherever else you might happen to be. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss the next instalment. Bye!
and he screws up like a lot. The only point about Peter's character that I really dislike is the need to explain how he knows so much about London's history and the fact that there's no real explanation given for where all of his scientific knowledge comes from. It's like on the one hand you've got way too much explanation of how he knows stuff and on the other hand he knows way too much and there's no explanation for it. Certainly there is nothing in his background um, or habits that suggests anything that would explain such knowledge.
Peter, meanwhile, has concluded that someone must have warned Pike about their plan, um, which is how he ended up heading them off and shooting Nightingale. This is an uncomfortable conclusion because there are only a few people who knew about it and they're all police officers. and started getting younger again and so he appears currently to be a, a roughly middle-aged man when in fact he's I, I, I think at least like 90, 100, something like that Yeah, he's, he's not one of the guys off the Big Bang Theory, okay? He's just... It just doesn't quite work. So, on the one hand, it's good that he has this kind of analytical mind and tries to find the answers to explain magic in a scientific way. But on the other, it detracts from the believability of the character, in my opinion, because it just, it just doesn't make sense that he knows all of this stuff and that he would think in this way. So, despite the fact that he doesn't really have any background in science whatsoever, Peter somehow manages to come to the conclusion that magic is um, a lot like 
the laws of thermodynamics. So casting spells requires power, and if you cast a spell, um, power is kind of sucked from something nearby. So this is similar to what happens to humans who use too much magic, in that it eventually drains all of the energy out of them if they don't limit um, their use and allow themselves to kind of have time to recuperate. They kind of suck the energy out of themselves and this is how you end up with cabbage brain. Um, it's a lovely thought isn't it? Cabbage brain, magical sucking, ooh, dear me. So Peter and Leslie continue to investigate this, while Nightingale takes Peter to visit Father Thames upriver. This is all an attempt to broker a, a peace between him and Mama Thames, as it would seem that there's some kind of dispute going on as to who presides over which part of the river. Peter's self-deprecating humour, his constant quips, his banter with Leslie and to a slightly lesser extent Nightingale um, often make it seem like this is just kind of a fun jaunt through London uh, and this, this scene really kind of grounds the reader again and reminds them actually no, this started with a murder, like a fairly horrific murder and that is what the book's about, you know, they are police officers, they work in London and London is not the best place to work in when you're a police officer it's it's really quite hard so i think you know he needed that to just remind people that there were serious issues going on as well as all the light-hearted humor and the funny stuff um so that's good very very well done 
Peter is able to um, prevent Cooper Town from escaping, but the man actually dies before they can do anything with him. He um, rants incoherently and then just kind of collapses and dies. His face, oddly, um, just kind of collapses in on itself, like falls off or something. It's really very odd. And um, Nightingale tells him that this has been caused by a spell of some description. Um, which alters a person's facial features and makes them look different. This explains how the ghost could have seen him change his face and then kill the guy because he did literally make his face look different and then kill the guy. So that's um, how he did it and why his face has collapsed but the thing they can't figure out is why on earth anybody would cast this spell knowing that it would one kill them and two make their face fall off so it just it doesn't really make much sense so the autopsy is conducted by nightingale's magic doctor by which i mean a doctor who is aware of magic and, and specializes in treating people who have been afflicted by magic not in, he's not actually magical um he's uh, dr wallet and he becomes a recurring character throughout the series and, and kind of their go-to person for anything when it connects to medicine. Um, and he shows them Cooper Town's brain, which is kind of cabbaged, and that becomes a, a sort of a coined term by Peter for describing what happens to somebody's brain when they've used too much magic. It, it kind of ends up looking like a cabbage. So, with the fun thought in mind that his brain could become cabbaged if he uses too much magic, Peter carries on learning to use magic. Um, he starts by learning about magical residue, which is called the stygium, and it's what le what's um, left behind when people cast spells or when anything kind of magical happens. He also learns to cast his own spells, or, or begins to at least, with the, starting with a really simple one, which is like a little light, it's called a wear light, and it's just like a little glowing ball of light. Um, and uh, he and Nightingale are called in to investigate other cases as they go, all of them involving the supernatural in one way or another. One of them is the result of um, rivalry between the river gods and uh, Peter discovers that um, the rivers all have spirits and this is of course where the book gets its name, the rivers of London. Um, the other case is um, about a family who were apparently killed by vampires. until they conclude that somebody must have cast the spell on him rather than him being an actual practitioner of magic. 